Okay. I think uh, I think that's pretty good now. Yep. All right. Okay. Cooperative Legacy Project Interview Number 20, October 19th, 2005. We're visiting with Richard Harwood, former Union Center Farmers Union Oil Company and South Dakota Farmers Union Director. Richard, where were you born? I was born in Sturgis. In Sturgis, okay. In 1933. All right. And where was your family originally from? Uh, and when did they settle out here? Oh, my my mother's dad and mother come from Bone Steel, Gregory County. And my uh, dad's family come from down around Springfield, South Dakota. Okay. Grandpa Danker moved out here in 1909 and homesteaded, and my Grandpa Harwood come in 1907. And uh, way back, where did they come from? Well, my grandpa and my mother's family come from Germany, and my dad's mother come directly from Holland, and my uh, granddad's side come from England. Okay. And um, you had brothers and sisters? Yeah, I got one brother and one sister. Okay, where are they at now? Well, my brother's on the home place, and my sister's in Sturgis. Okay, where's the home place at? It's about five, six miles south east of here. Okay, okay. And uh, what are some of your earliest memories out here? If you think back to when that was. Well, it, way back we had post office and grocery stores and creamery stations. Quite a few of them scattered around the country. A lot more people here then? Oh, a lot more people than we got now, yeah. Probably three times more at least. And then all the little stores closed up and... Creamery's closed up, and as people started going to town, got better roads, and then that's when we decided to build a co-op out here. Mm -hmm. Union Center, Farmers Union started, that's how Union Center got its name, because it was, Farmers Union started a store and creamery and post office. Okay, so there was a store there originally. Yeah, well, there was a store and a creamery and a mm -hmm. post office. Okay. Um, what was your dad's name? Andrew Harwood. Andrew, okay. He was on the co-op board before I was. Huh? And what's, would you like to talk a little bit about him? What sort of a person was he? Well, he was just an ordinary westerner, I guess. <laughs> he liked cattle and yep. liked horses. And we'd done, of course, we'd done all of our work with horses when I was little. And my dad probably had one of the first combines in the country and and uh, so well, he had one of the first tractors around here too that was on rubber mm -hmm. what was your uh, your mother's name Catherine Danker her maiden name was you like to talk a little bit about her oh well, she home person of course and done all uh, everything that you do on the farm. She had chickens and we raised ducks and she done the milking some part of the time. Always had a garden and pretty much just stayed at home and done what was needed to be done at home. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned She was a teacher to start oh, with. Okay. That's how she she was a teacher, that's how she met my dad. Okay. She country was, school or Yeah, teaching in a country school in my dad's where my dad grew up, his uh, school. He was out of school. Mhm. When did uh, your family get involved in Farmers Union? Well, I probably was the first one <coughs> to get started in uh, with the Farmers Union. 
a little bit be, when I was in high school. I done some, got involved with some of the trips to Minneapolis and some of them things because we didn't have no youth program in our area. We did have a local farmers union local, <clears throat> and I. Then when I got married, then I become a member and got to involved in the farmers union. Mm -hmm. You said there was a local out here. What kind of activities did they do? Did, what was well what at the local? It, at the time, the union center was developed. Of course, it was way before my time, and I don't really know who did develop that, how it was, I don't know how it started, and uh, and set up by, with the two of the, well, where I live now, the two brothers that owned it, they were really involved in Farmers Union, and they're the ones that kind of got me involved in it and got me interested in okay, it. Okay, what was their name? Halverson, Cliff and Harry Halverson. Oh, okay. They was from down by Vermilion. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, sometimes I have to scan my questions because you already answered me <laughs> one that I hadn't asked yet. Did you always want a ranch when you, when you were young? Oh, that yeah. What you wanted yeah. to get? I couldn't wait to get out of high school so I could start farming mm -hmm. and ranching. Mm -hmm. I liked farming. I was okay. I was more of a tractor guy than a horse guy. <laughs> ah, all right, all right. Is that a kind of a split out here, or is it? Uh, uh, well, they, yeah. Most people do both. Yeah, most people. There's a lot of ranching, but there's where I grew up was. Pretty much both. You do both. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there a? I got a question here. Is there, is there a difference between a farm and a ranch? In your view, I once had went to a meeting where uh, uh, the the moderator asked the people, "What's the biggest problem around here?" And a woman got up and said that uh, the biggest problem was that people needed to know the the difference between a farm and a ranch. <laughs> yeah, there's people that definitely. Think ranching is uh, oh I don't know what you'd say they're they're definitely ranchers they're not farmers they don't want to be considered farmers but I all my life I've been a rancher and a farmer and so has my families mm -hmm. all been mm -hmm. farmers and ranchers but there are families around that they don't want to be considered farmers they're definitely ranchers. Yeah, did that affect uh, whether or not they were willing to be farmers union members? <laughs> yes, it did. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, how was how was life on the farm and or ranch different? You know, back in earlier years than it is to, today. No, oh, tremendous difference, Jeepers. You said you were using all horses, or what yeah, you? we. Everything was done by hand. You didn't have electricity, and you didn't have water, running water, you didn't, everything was done by hand. Now, of course, you got all power. You don't shovel grain, you got grain augers, and you don't pump water by hand. It's got water systems, and of course, with electricity, why, that does a lot more of your work, and so it ain't. You put in long hours yet, and there's still a lot of <coughs> stress involved, but it isn't as physical of course, you do do a lot more. You don't. Then, if you had forty, fifty cows, you had a good herd of cows. Now you got to run two or three hundred head, or you don't make it. And so you got to do so much more. Mm -hmm. But it it's a different type of work than you used to have. And of course, we always had milk cows. Everybody had chickens and milk cows. Now, very few. Almost nobody has milk cows, or very few have chickens even to mm -hmm. get their groceries with. What is the average ranch and farm size around here these days? Well, mo the average family probably runs between around 200 head of cows. 
But how many acres does it take per cow? Oh, it takes about 16 acres to a cow for okay. a year. And, of course, you got some that are getting bigger. They're moving yep. into three and 400 head, mm -hmm. trying to make it work better. But land prices have doubled in the last three, four years, making it really hard. Outsiders coming in with money and they don't have to make a living on the land. They want to invest it. And they make it awful hard for a person that wants to have a family operation and make a living. Mm -hmm. Going back again, did you or did you attend country school out here? Yeah. What, yeah. Was, that, what was that school? Was there a name to it? Or? Well, it was the Berry School. Berry it's, School, okay. It's about seven miles south of here. Is, it, is that the one that's still in operation now? No, no. it's uh, the building is still there that I went to school in. It's been vacant though mm -hmm. for 20, 30 years. And then there's a newer school that's about a half mile from it, but it's vacant now too. Okay, are there any other country schools operating around here anymore? Or yeah. Or just going to Sturgis? No, there's country schools. There's one at Union and there's one at Inning. Mm -hmm. And then there's, I guess, two or three others out here yet that are still operating. Okay, okay. My daughter still, she aids or teaches in one of the rural schools out here yet. Mm -hmm. How, how far, uh, are, do they go in in the, in the schools here before they go into high school? Does they go to the eighth grade. Eighth grade, okay. And then they go to. Well, they go to Faith and Sturgis okay. and Newell and Wall and New Underwood from this area, different directions. Mm -hmm. When you were in school, what was country school like out here? Well, there was about 12 or 13 of us in all different grades. and We had no, no everybody brought water. Take turns bringing water for the school. And Didn't have a well down there. No, no oh. well, and we heated with the wood or coal stove. And we had a family of skunks that lived under the school all the time. Really? About, yep. <laughs> was that ever a problem? Oh yeah, there was. We never missed school because of the smell, but some days it was pretty strong. <laughs> I've never heard of anything like that before. Oh but. yeah. Okay. We had that problem all the time. All right. And you, you attended high school in, in, Sturgis. in Sturgis. I graduated from Sturgis in fifty one. Okay. Okay. What was what was high school like in there then? Did you did you drive in or did you no, stay in there? No, I I week? stayed with somebody. There was people in town that had an extra room or something and they would take high school kids in and they still do that. They, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that a universal thing, or do some of them uh, drive? There's some drive, a few. Yeah, probably drive. not with today's gas prices. Yeah, they probably change that again, too. But yeah. No, there's a few that drive, but not very many. Most of them stay with somebody. Mm -hmm. Or else, like when we put my kids through school, we had a trailer house in town, and and my wife stayed with in town and took care of the kids and that's what my Steve done my boy did with his children too to put them through high school okay so you batched out here yep by yourself I batched for 21 years yeah. where did uh, you meet uh, Pat at Was she from right around here? Or? She was from New Underwood, and I met her in New Underwood. I uh, I had a friend down there, which is now my brother-in-law. I uh, went down to see him, and there was rural dances, and, mm -hmm. and uh, he. I went down to New Underwood to dances, and that's where I met her. Okay, just checking there. We're in good shape. Um, and uh, when did you get married? We got married in 1955. 1955, yeah. okay. And you were married, how long was it? Now? We was married 47 years. 47 she passed years. away 
two, three years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um. She taught. She taught for twenty years. Okay. And she went. She grad. She went to college in Shadron, and she went to. Uh, got her. Uh, degree in spearfish and taught. Well, she got. She taught in uh, Whitewood and Piedmont, in the inning. Uh-huh. She was uh, active in the Farmers Union Youth. Oh program. yeah, so yeah. She, she right after we was married, why well, she started working with the youth program, and worked with it as long as she could. Uh-huh. And all of our children went through the youth program. Okay. Uh, when you were first getting started here, did do I remember hearing you say that you were, you know you worked for some other ranchers around here? Or well, I you were getting started, or did you did you start out here right away? Well, I worked a little bit for some of the ranchers. My dad and I built houses some for local out here, mm-hmm. and I uh, worked on shares. I on run cattle on shares and uh, with my granddad and and different ones and in the summertime I worked on a road crew in Nebraska and I was here come up here in the winter time then and and farmed and mm-hmm. with my dad and and uh, but to make ends meet while well, I worked on road crews in Nebraska and I drove truck for a local trucker for several years here all in cat livestock and grain. Mm-hmm. <coughs> uh, did you uh, serve in the military at all? No, no. I you never kind of got out of high school about the well, time. Well, I was the Korean. It was in the end of the Korean deal. I went yeah. and took my physical, and they told me that they'd see me in six weeks. And in the meantime, some of the local people or boys, they got nervous and said they weren't going to wait and they joined and they filled the quota and so I never went. Okay. It was, how did the quota work in those days? Well, they had the draft and they each board or area was to produce so many into the military. and So if there weren't volunteers enough or people that signed up, why then they drafted to make their quotas. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned uh, you've got kids. Where Steve is right here. For yeah, me. Steve's on the home place here with me. Yeah. And got one daughter in Sturgis. She's a office manager for a dentist, and mm-hmm. I got one daughter that lives up by Marine. She's in uh, aid in a school there, and I got a boy down at Crawford, Nebraska, ranching down there. He bought a ranch and ranches down there. Okay. I got 11 grandchildren. All right. When was the Farmers Union Oil Company over here organized? That, they they have had a fiftieth anniversary, haven't they? Yes. Yeah. Boy, I'm not sure. I helped sell stock. When the the two brothers, Halverson brothers, here was really the big one part of the big instigators to get it started, and they got somebody to come in from uh, the exchange and help sell stock and get it organized and get it started. Mm-hmm. And it was pretty much all volunteer help that put up the first building and the first facilities. And then I worked there part-time for a few, a couple, three years. And mm-hmm. my dad, then when they, organ, they had a temporary board and then they set up a, permanent board and my dad was one of them on that board and then when he retired from the board then I went on the board and when I retired then my son Steve's on the board now so kind of a family tradition well we've stayed with it yeah we're the only ones that the family has been all the way through 
and we've bought Sturgis, a, st a private one there, we bought it. It was the first one we acquired, and then Belfus was in financial troubles, and so we merged with them, and then the Central Exchange, they had a propane business in Rapid and one in Hot Springs, and we bought them here a few years ago. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, Sunex just independently runs the station or stations in Rapid, right? Yeah, yeah, no, we don't. We never, they wanted to sell us the stations, but uh -huh. we, uh, no, we have not purchased. That's a pretty competitive market. Now. Oh, well, they're, yeah, they're not very profitable. Yep. And it, to keep it working as a local co-op and local control, I, looks to me like if you spread out too far and too much, you lose control. What was it that you and your family liked about cooperatives? You've been involved for, with it for a long time. Well, doing business with your own company is the main thing. And to get local service, we didn't, out here where we are, we didn't have no service. You had to go to Faith or Phillip or Rapid or Sturgis and... We, if you have a flat tire or if you had oh, hydraulic hose needs or anything, why well, you had a lot of travel to do, like 50, 60 miles anywhere to get service. And so it was just, has really been a awful nice service for us in this area. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when you were first elected to the board? What year that would have been, or take no, a take a guess? Around I don't approximate. And it must have been in the seventies, somewhere late seventies, maybe. Okay. I could probably look it up and tell you, but mm -hmm. I don't. I was on twelve years. I was on the oil board. Okay. Okay. I started out as a member, and I was president of the board when I re quit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that about the same time you went on our board? Or well, uh, well, yeah, board? yeah, then right after, about the same time, I went off of the oil board, then I went on the state farmers union board. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned acquiring the, the other... Uh, uh, the 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 Valfouche and the, the the place in in Sturgis and so on. What uh, what kind of issues did the co-op have to deal with during those years with with the mergers? Yeah, and the in the eighties, I know there were certainly some economic. Oh, we out there. well after we started here in Union, there was several years that we was financially pretty strapped, and we had some really tough decisions to make and then acquiring the other stations they were weren't as hard as it was when getting our own established and, and based out here at Union to go on because mm -hmm. we already had some capital and, and so but yet there was yeah after we had Sturgis there was a few years at times when it got transportation and product was really tough and expensive to try to compete. Mm -hmm. Just like now, competing with these major stores and stuff is, is really hard because they can sell product cheaper than we can acquire. Mm -hmm. were, uh, were there any uh, memorable folks that you worked with during those times? Uh, other people on the board, managers, uh, whatever? Oh, I've worked with quite a few managers and and people on boards, too, I've been with. But they all have been pretty, have been good to work with. Our first manager was Jack Bergman from Minnesota that started it, and he was really a really a salesman and really he's probably been the most aggressive manager we've had all together mm -hmm. and we've 
We've had pretty good luck with managers. We just have a new general manager now. What is his name? Jeff Radway or uh, not Radway? I don't can't tell you, remember his last name, but anyhow, I do know he was married to Ben Radcliffe's granddaughter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think was working for farm for Cenex up in North. Yeah, Dakota. he was a field man for Cenex. Yeah. Um, when you were uh, you were also involved in the in the Farmers Union local here and oh yeah, I, bef- well, before I was first local president and on the local officer, and then I became county officer. And I was county officer for, I don't know, 30, 40 years. For, mm-hmm. I just finally, this last year, retired from the county office. Okay. Okay. What did you like about Farmers Union? We talked a little bit about the co-op. Uh, was well, there a tie together there? Well, yeah, Farmers Union, of course, and Farmers Union members, we were the ones that done the work in and pushed for the co-op. And mm-hmm. farmers, of course, we have Farmers Union uh, or co-op elevators and uh, fill up and that we do business with and well it's just the idea of doing business with your own company and not being tied up with private outfits I Uh guess Uh always you've always got the possibility of getting some earnings out of it if there's any money made yep yep I where they say you do business with a private outfit. You used to get a cigar or a calendar or something. I have some pretty good earnings and dividends in co-ops. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there was always a close tie between the co-op and the farmers. Oh union. yeah, the farmers union was always the push for co-ops. Like our even our tel- we've got a co-op telephone here, which is expanded large, huge company, Golden West, and my son-in-law, he's a secretary and on the co-op board for Golden West, and then he's also on the state co-op board. Okay. And uh, RERA, I can remember when it come in in 48, when they turned it on the co-op, when they started it, and it, is, it has changed a lot. I don't quite understand it. Because when they come in here, it was rural, and they come in and you could get a pump station or into a house. Now, if you want some, it's terrible expensive. They charge you extremely high prices, full cost to put it in to service into you. But yet they have money to loan to other operations people want to develop something or another but yet when a rural place like here put three poles up for to hook up a trailer house and it cost us over two thousand dollars really yep and they want to tear out anything that's not being used you have to pay to keep the line there which i know of two instances here in my neighborhood where the service was taken out then the land changed hands and the people wanted the service back in but they have to pay to get it back in and it's it's expensive mm-hmm. how much did it originally cost when service went in here well it didn't did cost it? you anything to yeah. hook up you just did if you was signed the initial up membership yeah fee. you was signed up and you yeah you just hooked you up and mm-hmm. that could for pump stations and then Pump stations got, to, so it costs a little bit, but then it just got worse and worse. Uh-huh. And I hear that a lot with rural electrics. How come it's costing so terrible much now to hook up? Uh-huh. You mentioned Golden West. Uh, 
Uh, when did you get? Did you have telephone service before at all, or did, did no? Were, were well, we had ones to bring it in here. We had some little local, old style phones mm -hmm. around neighborhoods put together. The old wooden crank. Yeah, phones. my dad and we put them up between families, local deal, and mm -hmm. kept them up. We I helped put them up even some of the lines, and then the. First rural telephone come in, they put the wires on the power poles. And that had to been in the 50s. And then they, later on, then they put underground buried cable. And now they put in the second update of fiber optics here just about five years ago. Mm-hmm. So we've got the latest in material. In earlier equipment. years, did you have a lot of problem with like snowstorms knocking the holes? Oh out? yeah, ice storms. Yeah. Of course, it was on the REA. A lot of it was on the power poles. Not all of it, but most of it. So the main thing was ice that took it down mm -hmm. the wires, break the wires. So then, if you lost one, you lost both. Things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were elected to the South Dakota Farmers Union Board in, do you remember what year it was? Oh, I don't know, really. I don't remember. I, rem I know I was on the board 12 years. Okay. But um, I can't tell you. Well, I can tell you what year it went off, maybe. Yeah. Well, I was on from 1988 to 2000. Okay, okay. That's about when I was thinking. It was about the same yeah. time Dallas was first elected. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Lee was just going off, and Dallas mm -hmm. come on. Mm -hmm. And your predecessor was John Youngberg. Yeah, yeah. yeah John was on. George Levine was on, and then mm -hmm. John Youngberg, and yeah. then I was. Yeah. Uh. What sort of issues were you dealing with at the Farmers Union at that time back in the uh, 90s, I guess it would be primarily? About the same thing they are fighting for now is a decent price for yeah. a product. Mm -hmm. It hasn't mm -hmm. changed much. And the taxation is still the yep. same problem as we had then. You, you just carry a heavy load of taxes and, and getting it is worse now than it was then as far as cost and the, what you get for your products, your livestock and grain. Grain now is cheaper than it was in the 40s. In the late 40s, we got $3.20 for grain, and you can't get that now. It's below $3. And I hear where they're getting a dollar and a half for corn, and some even sold some for a dollar twenty. Mm -hmm. For corn and a tractor now is eighty thousand dollars because they're more horsepower. But then you could buy one for a couple thousand, yep. and a pickup for a couple thousand, and a car for nineteen hundred. And now you can't touch them for less than twenty thousand. Yep. <clears throat> and everybody knows where fuel prices have gone. Are there uh, farmers union leaders that stand out? Uh, the people you've worked with over the years. I suppose you go all the way back to uh, what Paul Opsel back in the fifties. Well, yeah, I, I heard of him, but I wasn't involved with okay. him then much. Ben Radcliffe was probably mm -hmm. the first one that I really, when my children was taking youth, and when we was really got involved in the state part of it, not just the local part. Because at first it was mainly just our local part. I'm on the list too to not be called. Yeah. But it don't help, I don't think much. Well, they have some exemptions, I guess, that they, oh, that yeah. they can justify some of Well, if they're political, yeah. they're non-profit, mm -hmm. and all kinds of things. Um, 
Do you, do you feel in, in general uh, cooperatives, uh, that cooperative education is important? Oh, it's extremely important. Because <clears throat> if we didn't have cooperatives, there wouldn't be much competition for a lot of different operations. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's hard to tell what we would, even with our competition in like petroleum now, we're so small compared to the majors that we don't really give them much op- opposition in in product and stuff. And we wouldn't have near the service we've got if it wasn't for co-ops. Mm-hmm. I think uh, the, the the speaker at the Co-op Month Banquet this year referred to cooperatives as a market correction yeah. uh, mechanism oh, to, yeah, yeah. to kind of make the throw a little honesty yeah, at least just in. Just like now in our petroleum, you know, it's it's really gotten way out of hand. They admit there's no shortage, but they use every excuse they can find to push the price up. Mm-hmm. And if we get, like now with the co-ops and the local, if we can get enough, like, ethanol produced and uh, biodiesel why, to where we can get a volume enough to be noticeable then things will change a little but mm-hmm. it'll have to be produced on enough volume that it affects some of these major controllers of our crude oil and our petroleum because mm-hmm. you know I can remember back when grain would get up to a pretty good price like five dollars a bushel and they'd slap a ceiling on it and I know once and maybe more when cattle prices got up to where you can make a pretty good profit and people started hollering and they put a ceiling on that well i've mentioned that on crude oil why don't they put a ceiling on and they say well they can't well they can because they've done it to everything else that they want to at the time it got to a certain point, they could have put a ceiling on crude oil prices so it couldn't, because they've done it on farm products, but they didn't do it to crude oil because it wasn't in their interest. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We were talking about uh, also about cooperative education. Do you think co ops are doing a good enough job to putting enough resources into educating the public? Uh, on the value of cooperatives? And do you think people understand that value as well today as they used to? Well, in your rural areas, I think people understand co-ops if they're interested. They, of course, a lot of people aren't interested. And now we've gotten to where there's a lot more credit unions. And that has a lot more people, at least in our area, in this state, understanding co-ops maybe not all over that way but I think it is getting more interest than it used to because I know the credit unions really have in the towns and in this state anyhow affected more people Uh I don't know in your big cities and stuff, how your credit unions work, or yeah. if they're co-op stores or not, not really, I don't suppose, as much as they are like in a rural state, mm-hmm. I would imagine. Are there credit union members out here in Union Center, or are they mostly into the hills? Well, we've got a credit union at uh, Faith. Okay. that does ag loans and they have expanded they're into Pier and Hedinger and they're in spread out Lemon in quite a few towns and they are doing a good business they're doing they're just keeping it just a matter of Pier was in into it just in the last five years or maybe three years I think it was that they've spread to peer and they're doing real good and it's the only ag credit union here that I know of in this west south Dakota Uh but yeah in town those credit unions have been new ones and old ones expanding quite 
a little in the last 10 years. Okay. Uh, and you obviously still pay attention to the issues that are facing the co-ops out oh, here, yeah. particularly the, the oil company. Yeah, I stay in touch with it, <laughs> what's going on. If there's something that I don't think is quite right, I still voice my opinion. Mm -hmm. Is there any feeling out here that uh, kind of uh, concern over uh, over the uh, round of mergers and regionalization that's been going on? Uh, the mergers need to happen, probably. Uh, how about regionalization? That where the the the, the regional co-op actually takes over ownership of the local co-op. Yeah, I, I myself, I don't think it's good, but because you lose it, local control and local interest as soon as the regional takes over. <clears throat> they don't, people don't have the interest that they did before. And uh, you're getting back towards where it's not really run like the old type co-op. It's run more like a business from the top down and the local people don't just have as much say as they used to. Mm -hmm. I think it's going the opposite way from what co-ops really was originally thought of or started out as. To be owned and controlled by your customers, your mm -hmm. patrons. Is there still a pretty strong feeling here uh, to keep this, this yeah. one uh, I, owned? Yeah, I, I do and I, the people I talk to I try to show them the advantages of staying locally controlled. I know it's hard to compete with the bigger companies mm -hmm. when you're small and local, but the idea, the reason the co-op was really started in the first place, which is so a guy that bought one would get something for the same price as a guy that bought a hundred or more of mm -hmm. the same product. Mm -hmm. And it's the co-ops are getting away from that too, because a guy that comes in and takes a transport load of fuel, he'll get a break over a guy that comes and buys two or three hundred gallons. Yeah. And it it's not the way the co-op idea was started. Uh, you are uh, supposedly retired now. You're yep. you, you're still. Helping out, are yep, you? Uh, I with, uh, still work. Steve and Don down in the Yeah, I still mm -hmm. work pretty much full time. Yeah. I can't. I, of course, I've only sold my cattle. It's only been a year, so. Okay. It'll take a while to get used to the okay. idea. But it's nice not to have the full headache of everything. Yeah, yeah. What do you do in your spare time if you have any? It sounds like you're, you don't have a lot yet. Do you, I are you mainly, fishing or anything like that? I no, I used to do lots of fishing when I was younger. No, mainly I visit my children and grandchildren and go to their athletic mm -hmm. games and stuff. There's, I got they play. Of course, most of them are getting older now. Beyond high school and sports so I still have four of them yet that are in high school doing sports and so mm -hmm. I uh, that's what I spend most of my time going to their sports mm -hmm. they play uh, volleyball and basketball and football and then I got one boy that plays yet a legion baseball so that's what I stay and then I keep contact with the rest of the grandkids. They're all mm -hmm. getting grown up. But I don't have no great-grandchildren yet. Okay. Only have one grandchild married. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you, would you give someone today if they were asking you about uh, getting started ranching or getting started uh, being involved in the cooperative or farmers union or whatever? Well, or different advice to different people. Well, you want, if you're going to start farming or ranching, either one, you want to like it and you don't want to plan on being rich. You want to be dedicated to it. I 
have told several young families, couples, that farming and ranching, you've got to be married to it. It's just like marriage. You've got to be totally and take the ups and downs and and uh, be totally dedicated to it because if you don't, aren't, you won't make it. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, it's a good life, but it's tough. And you're not going to have much money for cash flow. Are you, uh, as you look to the future, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Do you think things are going to get better around here or not so good or be, maybe the same? Or I would probably guess it will probably always be about the same. I Things have changed in the last 10 years. Enormous outside money coming in, which I don't know how that's going to work in the future. It's going to be... It's just hard to tell because if they, in other countries where it wasn't family farm and local run and operated, it didn't work near as good and where these corporations or people with money own it and somebody else runs it. They just aren't as efficient and they just don't do as good as a family farm. So if they go too far to that extent why it's going to hurt in an overall picture I would say mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, of uh, the increase in farmland prices has it been out this far from the hills as well as oh, uh, close yeah. in? they're buying land out here and driving in there and working we, there's in the last few years there's been several do that mm -hmm. and they claim that they can drive from here like into rapid or the hills and work quicker than they did when they used lived in high populated areas where traffic was heavy and they said it's it's easier and and quicker of course it's a lot more miles mm -hmm. but it's and there, people are wanting to get out of them, out into the wide open, free, more free areas, to live. And so, yeah, they're moving, they're moving out here and buying mm -hmm. acreages. And mm -hmm. what sort of acreages do they buy? Do they well, it varies. Now we had one couple here that don't even have a family come in. They're retiring out of Colorado. Mm -hmm. And they bought a full size ranch and they're putting buffalo on it. They're running buffalo. Okay. And then we'll have them buy just a housing site. It varies. It it depends on the the family and and uh, or the people. There's some. I know up where my daughter lives. There were just a couple of come out of Colorado and they just bought a house site and then. Some of their relatives moved in there too with trailer houses to get out of away from. They don't just to get away from people. They don't even socialize much with the local people. They, those don't. <clears throat> it, so I, it's it's changing. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, like here now, this land someone's bringing three hundred dollars an acre, which is sounds really cheap to people that are coming out of Minnesota or other areas of land, they think, boy, what a bargain. Well, here, a banker or a loan officer, they figure on ag or like pasture land and life for livestock, not farm ground, why well, about $180 an acre is all they'll loan. They figure that's maximum for what it'll produce to pay for itself. Mm -hmm. But here they've got it pushed clear up to three hundred dollars an acre, because yep. people want to invest money in in one own land. Anything else you'd like to add regarding anything? No, no I just I've grown up out in the country, and I really don't anticipate living in town too much. I like the wide open spaces. Okay. We've been visiting with Richard Harwood. Uh, thank you for participating in the Cooperative Legacy Project.